So one of the things that I find really interesting is, is just kind of, you know, hearing a little bit about how people got started on that philosophy path, because it's not a default path for uh, everybody. And was it for you, Deb, or did you, how did you get into philosophy? What, what happened? Oh, well, gosh, I, you know, I had a very circuitous route. Um, so, so certainly it was not discussed around my dinner table uh, when I was growing up as a kid. Um, you know, my parents were uh, very much working class people. In fact, um, neither of them had more than a middle school education in England. They were both out working at the age of 13. They'd been evacuated during the war and things like that. So had all their schooling interrupted for long periods of time. And, uh, and then they moved to Australia in the 50s. Um, and so, you know, my household did not have all of those indicators of academic success that people talk about nowadays, like, you know, numbers of books and, you know, academic conversations and, you know, level of education of the parents and so on. Um, but, but what there was a lot of was a lot of humour, uh, a lot of teasing, um, which made for, uh, made for us kids being very resilient. We got used to being challenged a lot and we're very comfortable with that. And I think, um, I think that, uh, that humour and philosophy are very closely connected. And so it's not surprising that eventually I went into philosophy. But, but you know, after school, I went to TAFE and even that was considered rather poncy in my family. You know, why aren't you out getting a job? There was lots of conversations about that. Uh, and then it was at TAFE that I was starting to do some humanity subjects as well as I was in a commercial design program and um, we all had to take some humanity subjects. And it was there that I got exposed actually to uh, some political science and some sociology. And uh, somebody there said to me, why don't you go to university? And I think I literally said, what's that? You know, I was so clueless. Um, and that person said, you know, you can do sociology, politics, even take a philosophy course. And that was the first time that, you know, that I'd ever heard of this term philosophy. And then once I was at university, I took, uh, I did take uh, one philosophy course, and I was also taking a lot of politics and sociology. And I realised that, that the philosophers were asking the foundational questions, the fundamental questions, that there really was no point in trying to measure things like oppression or inequality or trying to have views about what justice and fairness would look like politically and socially without first understanding what those concepts meant and what, for not, what the phenomena were that we were trying to actually uh, discover. So I was drawn back more into those foundational philosophical questions, good old fashioned ones like what is justice, what is fairness, what's equality, what's oppression and so on. And that's how I ended up being uh, being drawn into philosophy. And then I realised that it was a lot of fun and fun is good, as Dr. Seuss says. Fun is good, yeah. And there's that connection <laughs> back to humour, which we'll also circle uh, back to. And um, as you've been chatting, I just dropped a few links for students to have a look at, including a, a very important link, I think, not to be underestimated, to uh, the um, underrated publication, uh, Cone, <laughs> Cane Toad Times, which uh, I believe you were involved in uh, the production of. So. If students eventually click on that, they'll actually go and see one of the issues, which is now of historical significance in the UQ archive, I believe. But can you tell us a bit about that as you're, you stepped up into this interface of philosophy, humour and student life in politics at uh, UQ? Right. So, so when I went to university then, um, I, had, I had done a lot of cartoons as part of my training uh, in TAFE in Queensland. It was the Queensland College of Art. And, uh, and I, you know, I thought, you know, it'd been a waste of time if I couldn't get them published somewhere. So I fronted up to the student magazine and I, I did some work for Semper, uh, you know, at the, at the time, um, which was the student magazine at UQ. And then the, the group of people who were editing Semper then created this um, magazine called the Cane Toad Times which was at the time Australia's only humour magazine. And so <laughs> we branded ourselves thus and so, but we really had, and we were kind of a counterculture uh, humour collective. And our target was the very conservative and corrupt um, government in Queensland at the time and corruption within the police force. And, you know, we had, you know, we had Reggie Didge journalists working with us and a whole bunch of, you know, artists and animators and cartoonists from, 
um, from uh, around Queensland and also some from other states as well. Uh, and we ended up feeding a fair bit of the information we collected in this, that period um, to the Four Corners report, which, which, uh, which prompted the Fitzgerald inquiry back in the day. So, so we were not just raising consciousness um, uh, about the, the corruption and the political uh, morass in Queensland at the time. Um, we, we also were uh, politically active. But I think that we, what we, our mantra was essentially that before you storm the barricades, you know, you need a good dose of ridicule. And, and ridicule or humour, taking a humorous approach, is a really great way to, to break down people, the barriers to people's ability to change their mind about a topic. Um, you know, if you can show people the absurdity of a certain line of thinking, you know, then that can have a greater impact than, you know, than just sort of, you know, blunt, the blunt force trauma of trying to change somebody's uh, political directions or political assumptions. Um, so that was the purpose of the magazine. And then it, it went, uh, it went from about, oh, it would have been about 1987 or 88, all the way through to um, Wayne Goss's government in the um, you know, so that would, yeah, not, sorry, not 87, it was much earlier than that. It would have been 83, uh, all the way through to about 89 when, when uh, Wayne Goss um, took over the premiership in Queensland and we all had to get real jobs. Um, but as you say, now, now it's, uh, it's at the archive is both at UQ and also at the State Library of Queensland and there was a big exhibition in 2011, which just reinforced in my mind that I'm history. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know about that. I mean, um, <laughs> students uh, who are interested in following through on that part of things can actually go and pick out at least two sets of cartoons that you have in that issue that uh, they can get to directly from the link. And it um, seems very contemporary to me. And what I'm interested in is, is the way in which you see, you've already you know, touched on it, but humor's mediating. It, it's, I mean, it, it's helping us change our minds. It's challenging assumptions. It's breaking down people's maybe uh, political stasis or other ways in which they're, they're stuck on things. So. Is that how you see the main sort of philosophical kind of connection as well, uh, or, or with with humour and, and these other kinds of activities, or or, or is it something else? Oh, I, I think formally there's a lot in common between humour and uh, and philosophy. I mean, if you think about the reductio argument, the the form of argument called reductio ad absurdum or reduction to absurdity, um, you can see, you know, structurally that works very similar to a good joke, a good joke which, which, you know, which sort of you're going down a line of thinking and then suddenly there's this incongruity and it makes you realise, you know, the, the suppositions or assumptions that you start with and makes you question them. Um, so, so I think that structurally you can see a lot of similarity between, uh, between you know, good forms of humour. Obviously slapstick doesn't have a lot of that kind of logical structure to it, in my humble opinion, but I could be shown wrong. Um, and also just good forms of argument. Um, but I think also, I think it's also that uh, effective engagement as well, um, you know, that, uh, that, that um, you know, will, willingness, the willingness to have your, your mind changed and also the, the willingness to explore new ways of thinking. Uh, uh, so I think effectively and also logically, um, there's a lot of, a lot of similarity between humour uh, and philosophy. Uh, and I used to joke that the way I did philosophy was I, you know, I figured out what punchline I wanted to make and then reasoned backwards. Um, it hasn't always proved to be easy, but <laughs> certainly. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, really interesting. So, you know, you'd be probably a, a fan of uh, the idea of stand-up philosophy, for example, which is such a thing, <laughs> right? As you know, probably there are some philosophers in terms of community engagement and getting people um, effectively involved and um, using those kind of uh, emotional hooks in some ways, not in a, an evil way, not in a manipulative way, but to, to sort of do more than um, grab attention, but to actually get people to take something more seriously than they might not have. So to take the unserious, to bring out the, the serious aspects, because there are serious issues, like in the background, you were talking about the, the uh, conservativeness of the government and the corruptness of the government um, that was in, in place. And that was a way to call attention to that, to get a hook in, in that. Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, it, it, the history of philosophy is riddled with um, with good jokes and bad jokes, and I think it's often the measure of, of a philosopher how good their jokes are. And one of my favourite examples is actually from Sextus Empiricus, you know, the the ancient uh, sceptic, right? 
who um, who records this uh, wonderful story. So at the time, you know, Sofa Street was right and was rife, and and the Sophists would use philosophical arguments to score points and in without without enough concern for, for the truth. And um, so the skeptics were not being skeptics just you know for the sake of being skeptics, but they had as their targets these Sophists who who they think abused um, philosophical methods and ways of thinking. And there's this lovely example that Sextus, Sextus records of Diodorus Cronus, who argued that there was no such thing as motion because either everything is where it is or is where it's not, but nothing is where it's not, so it must be where it is. But if it is where it is, then it, nothing is moved. And Sextus said, you know, Diodorus then dislocated his shoulder and took him, himself off to the physician, Herophilus, who then argued, hmm, either your shoulder is where it is or is where it's not, but nothing can be where it's not. So therefore, your shoulder hasn't moved and so it isn't dislocated, that'll be 20 drachma, please. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, Diodorus, you know, screams, you know, fix it, fix it, um, fix my shoulder. And I think it's that it's that incongruity between, you know, you know, your philosophical views have to be put to the test of experience. You have to be able to live by your philosophical views or they aren't worth a tin of beans. Uh, and I think that was that was a really lovely way of demonstrating the importance of making one's philosophy true, not just to yourself, but also to the world in which you which you live. It kind of keeps keeps us humble. 